Mm. You're in front of Jules Holland now, and and you, you're uh, your performance levels going up, the momentum's building, um, your 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 armory that you're gathering with every single scenario, good or bad, right or wrong, it's happening and it's not going to stop. And the album drops, and everything changes for you. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Well, I. I don't think I, I was really prepared for it, to be honest. And uh, I don't, I still, I still not really. Mm. Like all, of, all that comes with this. I've tell you the biggest thing for me what changed. Killer Killer podcast. Killer Killer official dot com. Street Culture TV. Beatbox created. Killer Killer. We need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Poland Sue salutes it. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast. Here we go again, live and direct, not in central London at all. Somewhere very remote. Mind your own business, you'll hear more in a second. And big shout out to everybody, all the sharers and carers, people that have been supporting from the jump, getting involved in this world of street culture. If you want more of that world, hit the television app, free download, iPhone, Android, for all of your street culture in sports. Our sponsors, the mighty GK Nifty Heads, have a massive 100,000 play to earn NFTs to give away to the streets. Just hit the link in the description or go to gknifteyheads.com and get ready for Hoddle Wars Summer 2024. Here's a moment. We have a gentleman inside his house. <laughs> Thank you for having us. That, uh, you know, is raised on the fertile soil of street culture. Like a lot of other people that come on the podcast, his pedigree starts back all the way from drum and bass, hip hop, from battle rapping to MC. Then further on his career from MTV to the Brit Awards to iconic moments in British music as a soul singer, merging and collaborating with some of the greats. I need not introduce him anymore than the mighty rag and bone man in the building. Hello, sir. <laughs> How are you? All right, thank you very much. <laughs> How is it in your home? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs> It's a blessing, brother. Honestly, and uh, you know, it's, it's 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 in a remote part of of uh, of Rag and Bone Man HQ, no less. Yes, um, sir. And very much a, a a creative hub win right now, right? Yeah, man. Tell yeah. me about that. Yeah, we're in the studs. Yeah, yeah. So the the writing process for you is very much a personal one, and uh, you just have yeah. all the facilities there ready to go. Yeah, man. I mean, listen, like. There's nothing better than being like in a comfortable space for writing, being somewhere like like here. You know, I I, I love it in the sticks because yeah. there's no distractions. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. Yeah, like I, I've experienced. I, I still write. You know, I still go out to London to write now and again. And but there's something about being close to home and just just in an environment which feels chilled mm. and you know no distractions we like distractions don't mm. we it's yeah. a nightmare for real for real <laughs> what's your biggest distraction you know uh, if you because you did spend a little bit of time in london didn't you what was the biggest distraction for you to you know cur- knock you off your uh, creative board i mean i think <laughs> i think when i when i first well when i moved to london the first time around it was i didn't have kids then mm. so it was too much it was too easy just to go out all the time yeah. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, my biggest distraction now is my children. As uh, in about, probably about half an hour, you'll see, like, one of them creeping around the, the window <laughs> somewhere. They'll be, like, knocking on, knocking on the door, seeing what we're doing in there. But, um, yeah, man, these days it's just the kids that are a distraction. Like, and, and I don't mind that. How does one put themselves into a mindset of... Because these are layman's questions, I think, for a lot of people that may be listening that ain't mm-hmm. in the music game. But the turnaround of being a father or working to straight, playful creativity, that, that in itself, you've got to f- harness how quickly you can turn that, yeah. that switch on, right? Yeah, and I, I've, I increasingly find that more difficult um, to do when I'm in the mode of, like, dad. <laughs> I really do. Like, um, I, I, like, I love being down here in a studio, but... When I know my kids are out there in the house mm. doing something fun or whatever, yeah. I'm like, I can't, it's very difficult to concentrate and just be like creative and be freely creative. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly. So a lot, a lot of the time, like, I'll, I'll do stuff down here when I know the kids aren't around 
and um I like till 12 or something like yeah, that. For yeah for real <laughs> exactly and um you know what if a, a lot of the time recently because they're getting to that age where they're really inquisitive about everything and mm. so they should be mm. um so like try to take myself into like what I consider to be like a working environment do you know what I mean mm. sometimes you have to leave the house to do that yes um so yeah, I've I've got various places that I go to mm. um, for that, you know, whether it's like bright, just down the road in Brighton or whatever. And yeah. you know, I've got a mate's house that I go to and work sometimes, where I just feel like I haven't got those distractions. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Time to play, the time yeah, to yeah. get yourself ready to play, and yeah. then go for it. It's like you, you know, you're putting your hand deep into a well <laughs> of a possibility, right? Yes, yes. Um, Brighton, yes, because uh, obviously. Being so close, you grew up within the uh, the circles of of rap, yeah. within the circles of street culture, hip hop, and drum mm -hmm. and bass. Yeah, yeah. How was that? You know, give me a, give me some background of like what age range that might have been, and some of the more significant moments in that time. Well, I, I grew up just down the road in a little town um, called Uckfield, which like big up Uckfield. Big, come on, big up all Uckfield. day, all day. <laughs> <laughs> where where like there was nothing really going on musically apart from jungle mm. um and that that's the music that first like made me want to spit or sing or whatever mm. i think i think because that all of my mates were listening to jungle and it was like our heroes were like shy fx and goldie and okay. you know so right. so hold on so th th were they were they how old were you at that time probably like 14 yeah sounds about right so because and I can relate to it in a little bit is that sometimes these genres get thrusted on you because your friends are into it, not necessarily because that would yeah, be a yeah, natural. Yeah. yeah. Right? So so my parents were all into like jazz and blues music, rock and roll and shit like that. Um, but yeah, that's you, you. You naturally at that age you want something to, you know, you want something that you're away from what your parents like or whatever. And that was my my thing at the time. It was like, you know, from the ages of about fifteen. To seventeen, all I wanted to do was go rave, yeah. and like, cause I, cause I looked older than all the other kids and that. Yeah, it was like, what do we do the weekend? I don't know. Bunk the train to Stratford Rex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easy and go, and go rave. But you must. There must be so many instances where you're waiting by the door, you know, blagged your way in, and all your yeah, mates yeah, are out yeah, to say, yeah. "No, we can't get in." You're like, well, sort it out. Like I'm yeah, already yeah. in now. For you real, know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, because we're in the presence of giants right here, baby. I have no <laughs> doubt about it. In your teens, was exactly the same, right? Yeah, yeah, for real. I was like six foot of fourteen, so <laughs> <laughs> no rest, no rest. I can imagine that. Which it's a blessing and a curse, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so uh, from uh, that point there, it was all uh, all breaks off, and you were going to clubbing. Yeah, man. Like, just it was just all about the rave, and then and then I think. First of all, we idolised the DJs and the music, and then, and then, like through kind of like, I was uh, at the same time loving hip hop and being introduced to hip hop by by some friends. That kind of rapping and MC culture mm. came into play, and we all started. Well, some of us didn't, but I think I turned my hand to DJ and I realised I was terrible at it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then instantly was like, okay, well maybe I could be the next Skibbity or. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or I, I could be the next MC Foxy. Shout out to MC Foxy. Oh, time Foxy. Ouch. <laughs> but um, do you know what I mean? So that that was like that's what we gravitated towards. Mm. And the, and the British hip hop fraternity as well was very much yeah. in your uh, in your sights as well. Like. For real. Well, yeah, man. I mean, a little bit later on, I moved to Brighton because you know Arkfield wasn't really saying much musically, and no one seemed to be sort of making music. Mm. So I moved to Brighton and met some. DJs and, and rappers who ended up being rum committee. So yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So break that down. Break break down the rum committee. Explain explain the the, the dynamics, the personnel. Well, so I, so when I first moved to Brighton, my my flatmate Pete Bish introduced me to Gizmo, um, DJ Direct, and a few of the others, and um, they had kind of already formed this collective they would already recorded tracks and that and mm. um and i and so i used to go to this open mic night called slip jambi which was at anybody's you know who's who's done the rounds of the uk <laughs> we'll see we'll know slip jam and um tom hines the guy that run it used to kind of coach me up and i'd i'd sometimes rap and then 
I would I would like sing over more the more jazzy kind of beats mm. and piano led beats and shit the things that had melody, mm. and um, and then just like through that I I think um, Giz and I approached me to be like yo we got these songs already do you, we'll send you some stuff and we'll see like you know see what you can do over them, mm. and I just ended up recording hooks um, oh, yeah. and, and to to their like tracks that are already done and then. And then um, yeah, we put we put some music out, and mm. that was rum for me. Did I think for a lot of artists within our genre, there is a purism to to the to the culture where everyone. <laughs> it's funny because the Lord of the Flies want everyone to be individual and unique, yeah, but yeah, as yeah, soon yeah. as you start doing something that's individual and unique, it's like, oh, whoa, 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 what are you oh, doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't yeah, like it's real. it's a funny old game. This yeah. old game uh, is was there was there any resistance in your head that you would do that sort of thing would there a moment where you're like well that does that compromise my mc um a, a stance like because you you loved both yeah but you were doing more and you were getting called up for just speaking on relative terms yeah, 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 here yeah, with beatboxing yeah. you know yeah i think i think it was reaction based like i would be on stage rapping and I always had it in me that I wasn't maybe quite as good as everybody else. Mm. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I would see the reaction I would get when I would sing, mm. and that was like mm. tenfold mm -hmm. what I would get mm -hmm. from when I would when I was rapping. Mm. So it was like, well, that makes you feel good, <laughs> you know, when you see people act that way. So yeah. it's like, I might I might have something here. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So, so it was really Can about it was, sleeve. it was really about that. It was really about the reaction I got when I was singing to when I was rapping was so much bigger mm. that I thought I'll, I'll probably just do this now. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. I might just put all my chips in this. For yeah, real, for real. same thing happened with beatboxing, bro. It's like yeah. I was a mediocre rapper, <laughs> but then as soon as I started beatboxing, I was like, hey, I could get used to this. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that mind moment of like epiphany, wasn't it? Crazy. Um, does that does that vocal dexterity that you have, the open-mindedness that you had at that time, does that lean back to a, a period of your time with your parents and the music that they were into? Does, was, the, was there an influence within that? Or was there other influences outside of drum, bass and hip-hop that were leading you to this conclusion that actually there's... I'm thinking of like Alo Black, Lend Me A Dollar. Yeah, I think the, the world's definitely collided because... I mean, it was it was probably one of the biggest influences was Jules Holland. Nice, yeah. Because well, the Squeeze era or his his show. No, his show. Right. Like because it because it crossed over. It was something that my mum and dad loved, mm. and you had like you know artists from bands like Led Zeppelin or whatever mm. appearing on there. You had blues artists on there, mm. but then you also had D'Angelo, yeah, uh, Roots Maneuver. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So people like that, and then so that that kind of like neo soul world of those people, that it, you know that that gave me a bit of mm. you know what I liked from, from yeah. like it had hip hop, but also had soul. So you know, oh, it's like Andy Stone and Jill Scott and Erica Badu and stuff like that it was like a really big thing for me. Mm. What well, were they significant artists that kind of hit like a switch, like an epiphany of? Is was there like one singular moment of a, in 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 a particular artist's catalogue where you're just like you may have seen it live, like you say, Jules Holland, where you're yeah. just like, yes, this is it. This is the prototype of what I envisage myself going in a direction. I think it's probably the Brown Sugar album, D'Angelo's mm. Brown Sugar album, what that made me want to write lyrics over hip hop beats because mm. mm. that was really the first thing I did when I was making music. Like, before that, I guess the only live stuff I'd done prior to Rum Committee was, like, just sitting with a guitar and playing, like, covers of old blues songs. Mm. That was what I... That's the only thing I earned money from. Mm. Um, so, like, you know, hearing someone like D'Angelo, like, singing over basically hip-hop beats mm. was like, I, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And he did it so well. He did it so well. I didn't do it as well. Nah, <laughs> but, you know, your journey's got to start somewhere. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, like, after the Rum Committee thing, that's where I ended up meeting Leaf Dog and getting involved with High Focus because yeah. 
me and Leafy hit it off because he's a big D'Angelo fan, mm-hmm. so am I. And um, and we just like got chatting about all these different artists that we mm-hmm. love or whatever. And he was like, look, come through. I'll make some beats. You sing over them. Mm-hmm. And that's that's like when I started my, pretty much when I started my solo career. Listen, at this yeah. point, I need to big up the mighty flip tricks all yeah, yeah. day. Four hours. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, my guy, my fucking guy. <laughs> um, and Leaf Dog, you know. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the high focus. Let's talk about that era. Very you know. prolific <laughs> producer is Leaf Dog. <laughs> yes. I think if you were just to sit down and go through the catalogue of what he's done and who he's worked No with, messing around. That was a hard working man, I'm mm-hmm. telling you. Grafter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, before I even met him, he'd worked with Wu Tang artists, he'd worked mm-hmm. with just like a ridiculous amount of people. And just a casual skateboarder. Yeah. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, MC. Yeah, just, you know, yeah, just. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Big up Leaf Dog. Yeah, man. Um, so, yeah, the UK hip hop, you, you found your home. Yeah. With the label. So, yeah, I made, made, made a couple of records with them. Mm. I made the Leaf Dog record and then I made a record with Dirty Dyke, which is. They're both like only EPs or whatever, but mm. it, um, I'm very grateful for that period of time. Because not only was the music cool, doing the gigs with those guys was cool as fuck. Like it really, really was. I was um, so I hadn't really performed that much. You know, I was comfortable sitting with a guitar and playing BB King. Mm-hmm. But like this was, it was kind of a new thing for me to stand on stage with just the DJ. At that time, it was just like me. Sometimes me and Leaf on stage. Sometimes just me and like DJ Fingerfood. Mad. You know, just you and a DJ. There's nowhere to hide, bro. It's like being a comedian. uh, I didn't really have a huge amount of experience with like stage presence, and I felt like I really had no charisma on stage. And 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 it's that kind of thing's quite important. And you feel like I felt a bit at the time like this is quite frightening. Really? So we're talking what kung fu era, early noughties. This was probably like late two thousands, probably two thousand. 11 probably okay. that started 11 12 maybe wow, so and um wow, okay. but i did I, I i what i i was grateful for at the time was i did like a little bit of touring with stig um i think stig at the time just was like oh, i need a hype man for a little while mm. do you want to come and do some shows with me and i was like yeah i'll just learn your material yeah, yeah. and come Big do up that stig. yeah come yeah on. and um so we did some shows together for like a year or two or whatever um and um actually like you know he's he's got um, like lots of charisma and a and a stage presence. Yeah. I think I learned quite a lot from him. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Just just those few shows that we did together was like I realised that I could stand and face a crowd. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. that uh, there was this tempting thing for me at the time, just to always just go like that yeah, or like. Yeah, t- yeah. Do you know what I mean? I was like I was very frightened of the crowd. I feel you. Yeah. You gotta learn that. It's no, uh, there's no classes for that shit. You gotta no, jump no, in. No, no, no. <laughs> it's like you gotta start somewhere. Yeah. And I like even now, like I'm, I'm doing shows to like I don't know how many people. Like it's, it's mad. Mm. There's a little bit of, the, of that that always creeps back in. What, just before you go on stage. Nah, just what, even while you're doing something, you and I'm like, hang on a minute, I'm gonna be facing the crowd. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it never really goes away. That little bit of fear. Mm. But I guess it's good. I don't know. Let's stick with that for a second because yeah. you know it's, it's it's all relative to the size of the audience and whatnot. But you know you've you've uh, managed to you know auditoriums and amphitheaters and yeah, yeah. arenas. You know, yeah. so this this little bit you know it's it's, it's ever present. You're always in it. Explain to me. Uh, explain to me the thirty. The three minutes before you go on stage, what is going on in your head? Levels of anxiety, etc. I wouldn't I wouldn't consider myself like a nervous person and like because I love performing live so much like mm. it's it's literally the best thing about music for me mm. I can't wait to get on stage that's so that three minutes beforehand is the worst period of time for me because <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to do it an hour ago yeah yeah do you know what I mean let alone in three minutes time so the standing on the side of the stage is the only time I'm really nervous yeah. It's the only time. Like, what about line checks? If you'd if you'd have to go on a line check and you're like, is everything going to sound all right? Does that ever? I mean, I, I've had a very good group of people around me, and I've always made sure that 
I work with great people mm. that I trust with my life. Mm. And so it's not, there's not really much doubt in my mind that it's going to sound good. Mm. Um, it's just like loads of little things go through your head in that three minutes. I don't doubt it. You're like, am I going to trip over a cable? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or yeah, yeah. am I going to blurt out the note? <laughs> am I going to be a semitone out the first time I see it? or something stupid that I know that it won't happen? Mm. But there's always something in the back of your mind. It's the gods, isn't it? Yeah, Looking for real. Down, they know. Yeah, yeah. Has there anything ever happened where you come to that conclusion that it might happen? I mean, surely not. It's just in your mind, isn't it? Worst case scenario, fuck, am I going to style this one out? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. One of the worst things that happened to me is I was um, about to go on stage and I've, for some reason I'd lost a bit of weight and my belt wouldn't do up quite tight enough and I pulled it and my belt snapped. And it was literally as I prepared to go on stage. And the only thing we could do is, <laughs> is, is find, I think it was like a shoelace or a bit of rope. So I'm end up performing to like 10,000 people with a bit of rope just dangling down. And it just look... <laughs> it comes the next fashion accessory, Yeah, right? yeah, for real, for real. But in that moment, I was like, my trousers are going to fall down because these won't stay up. Yeah, 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 you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> it's so either my those, shoe or my trousers. Yeah, yeah, for real. <laughs> That's insane. I mean, we've all had those moments. Yeah. And I guess that is the, that, those levels of anxieties are the things that keep you on point when you're actually delivering the performance, yeah, right? Yeah. It's kind of part of it. I think I didn't used to worry so much, but that's because like, that, that era of time when I was performing with Rumcom and High Focus, mm. I was never sober. Mm -hmm. I don't ever really remember, a, I don't remember a time ever going on stage sober. Really? Yeah. Because I don't know whether that was because I didn't take it seriously. I was just caught up. I was a bit younger. I was a bit, like, flippant about licking off half a bottle of rum before I went onto the stage. Um, I would never do that these days. Would you never do that these days? I would, I would do a couple shots, maybe. Cut the edges off. Yeah, but, yeah, not to the extent we used to. No. Because, like, that was ridiculous. I mean, I, I, I've, I've, I've looked at a couple performances from the peak of that era. They do surface <laughs> on it, on uh, socials, uh, yes. Uh, from, from a couple of rom-com performances, and I think, yeah, it's, it's maybe too much. Really? I, I, yeah. I went too far on Yeah, that. a little bit too far. <laughs> um, you think you're really good at yeah. the time. That's the worst thing. You think you're really good, and then you listen back, and you're like, yeah, yeah. yeah I was flat all the way through that. Yeah, and you I like Mick Jagger on the night. Didn't but, give a monkey. Yeah, dude, yeah. totally. Um, these are informative years, though, and, yeah. you know, UK hip-hop, um, has always been a, an incubation place, a, a social uh, environment for you to kind of hone a craft. And, um, and you know, they're a hearty bunch. They're, they're, they're good peoples and often help you along as yes, well, don't they? Yes, yes, indeed. With, um, with High Focus, Flip Tricks, again, Big Up, um, they almost like became the new, still do, really. They're the home for UK hip-hop as it stands. Yeah. You know, and Ocean Wisdom, yourself, yeah. Leaf Dog, Four Owls, Premier, you know, just a casual mm -hmm. club. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's come a long way. And you are part of that yeah. trajectory. Yeah. Did you see it like that at the time? Mm, I think they... I, I somehow... I mean, I think partly it was marketed very well mm. is, is one of the big things. Mm -hmm. I think where maybe UK Hip Hop didn't quite cross that little boundary... Before us, because they just it didn't, it wasn't quite for some reason. And I think it, that was down to maybe like the quality of like the videos, maybe the branding and stuff like that. It all just came together at the right period of time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, I mean. and the kind of like craziness of like people like Dirty Dyke and the weird yes, and the absolutely. weirdness of people like Baxter. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. They had like a little bit of everything. Yeah. Almost became the the mascots, yeah, of, the, of yeah. The, the the scene that was being created, mm -hmm. that, this new arm of the scene. Yeah, that almost had like a skateboard esque kind of. Yeah, exactly, to, yeah. exactly. Moved in a different way. Um, there were a lot of pioneers before, like you, the aforementioned Skinny Man Roots Maneuver. Absolutely, you know th these yeah. people. You know, you you grew up on them as well, right? I grew up on Task Force, man. Mm -hmm. I grew up on Task Force. I, I I wholeheartedly love loved and still love Chester and Farmer. Mm. Um, I grew up on the 
Louis Slippers mm. mixtape. Right? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, you know, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, do you know what I mean? It's it's it's. Uh, I, I I still love that music, man. How did you, uh, how did you approach? I would imagine gently and with care. Yeah. The the idea of making the transition within music as well as um, marketing to to become Rag and Bone Man, as my girlfriend knows it, Lisa. How did you? How did you, <laughs> how did you get to that point where it's like? you know, I've got an idea. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a really simple answer. Like, I just I just wanted to make pop music, I think. I just, I, I mean, I grew up with my parents listening to the Beatles and Otis Redding and stuff like that. And um, I just, I really do love pop music and I love, I love writing songs like that. Mm. Um, and it felt like, at a time, what I was doing was cool with High Focus and Run Committee or whatever, and it was very much like over those boom bap kind of nice style hip hop mm. beats. I didn't feel like I could achieve that. Mm-hmm. So, Going back to the MC kind of yeah, conundrum. yeah. So I had to do something else, mm. um, and there was a bit of resistance from from the UK hip hop camp. It was like yeah. people love to use the words like "Yeah, you sold out" or whatever those things, but really, all you got is to be authentic to yourself. Yeah, and you can't really give a fuck about what people say like that because it's just what what I felt at the time. And it was like, I had this mate from school, Mark, who I grew up with, and he was making music in um, a studio in Batsy. And um, he was like, should come, let's, let's try and write some songs or whatever. And I was like, sick, let's do it. And, and, we, and we wrote some tunes. We wrote this one tune called Ruben's Train, which is kind of based on a traditional tune but we kind of reworked it and everything and then suddenly all these doors open mm. and people were like they they want like these labels want to sign you and shit and like, doors as in um you made direct beelines to certain labels that you knew it hit the well, I w- the thing is i wasn't even after that at the time i no, was no. like let's just see where it goes yeah and um yeah people just started knocking on our door <laughs> and was like can we have this meeting, you know, with like Warner or Sony or all these different people? And I was like, okay, well, why not? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Let's give it a go. And you've already got your pedigree built within the, the yeah, history man. of music you've yeah. released. So and and yeah, and through through that song and through that that record at the time was called Wolves. Um, through that, I signed with Columbia Records. Crazy. Yeah. <sighs> and. The writing process, did that continue with Mark in yeah. Battersea? Yeah, yeah, it was with him. And I called on a few different people. We worked with um, some great people. This guy, Jamie Liddell. Love so, Jamie Liddell. Yeah, yeah man. He, so he's great. And um, and the, the lead singer from Bastille, Dan, I, I wrote some tunes with Brilliant. him. Um, and then this guy, Jamie Hartman, I worked with. And then we wrote a song, Human, together in 20. 15 maybe mm-hmm. and in my mind this tune was just like oh yeah, yeah it's cool yeah, sounds yeah. sounds sounds cool yeah and i played it to my label and i like they were like oh we're gonna put this out yeah. <laughs> i was like cool what well, you know whatever <laughs> I, you I was see it i wasn't i wasn't aware that this yeah. song was like anything other than i don't know i thought it was good but nothing you know i didn't know it was gonna do what it done yeah. and then suddenly like People were ringing me up, and you know, I've just heard your song on the radio, and and he's like, "Is like, I'm in Melbourne?" I was like, oh, sick! And Yo. then it's like, and then and then they just started connecting in all these different places. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like over in Switzerland, um, doing some tiny little festival or whatever, and then I'm getting in a taxi, and it's on the radio. Mm. And then suddenly they're like, "Oh, by the way, it's number one in 35 countries," and I was like. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, which absolutely blew my mind. It's not, and it's not at all what I was going for. I was yeah. just like, let's just see if we can build a bigger audience and play some bigger yeah, yeah, shows yeah, yeah, to yeah, people. Because yeah. that's really all I cared about at the time was playing shows. So we can see. Yeah. I was like, you know, you have those like goals at uh, different times in your life. Yeah. Like, you know, when I, was, when I was 18, my goal was to MC at Bagley's. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or like, <laughs> when I got to 22, it was like, I really want to play the Concord 2 in Brighton. Oh, yeah. And then like... Pressure you know, point. And then, and then suddenly, 
I'm playing Alexander Palace to 10,000 people and it's sold out two nights in a row and I'm like, can we stick what, on what's that? happened? Can we stick on that? Like, what's the... Because there is an endorphin hit at this point in the, the incline of your... Of, of, Everything that's happening, it's almost like that's happened, that that's happened. It's like, it's, it's mm-hmm. just this, you know, if you're in an aeroplane, it's just clouds flying past you every five seconds of, that's happened? This has happened? It's like unfathomable, unpredictable moments of timing, luck, full support from people that you'd never even think of. And you, 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 that must have been such an endorphin hit for you. Yeah, man. Yeah, well... well to be honest, at the t- I don't really remember a lot of it because it just felt like, like you say, it's like being on a train and you just just carries on going. Mm. Because once something like that happens, life is so busy. Mm. Like I didn't know busy before that. <laughs> that <laughs> <happened>. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, you used to yeah, it just used to do you, but then all yeah. of a sudden, everyone else is doing you now. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, <gasps> and then things happen that you never thought would happen, like. You know, this you're invited to come and play George Show, the George Holland show, and that now so I talk about it now, and it makes me smile the mm. way I felt when that call came in, and um, it was what I grew up on. Mm. I would watch that show from when I was I don't know ten Great. or whatever, sitting there like Full on set. the sofa watching it as a little kid, like this is a mate, and now I'm playing it. Not only am I playing it, I'm I'm, I'm singing my song with George Holland on the piano. It's like. Yeah. That's been one of the biggest bonkers. things of like, of, like absolutely incredible. I can't talk about it without stuttering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because because um, it feels like it's mapped out. Yeah. Uh, where's that come from? Where's that mapping out come from? Like, listen, everyone listening now. We can get into the deep stuff here because it's real. <laughs> this is the real realness of like uh, greatness, and people use that so casually. It becomes passe to say greatness, you know, or you know, think about it, be about it. You become it. It's the secret. Yeah. But there is this other thing which you can't quite put your finger on it. It's just this turning of a of a of a of a wheel that leads you to the thing you've been thinking about yeah. being, being in front of you? The way I think about it now is I, I look back in that period of time and I'm like, I don't even think that particular song was even that fantastic. <laughs> and it was just the way the dots connected at the time. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, like you can be like, oh yeah, that was the greatest song of the world. That's why it did so well or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's why it got me to that point. But actually, it was just the right place, right time. You prick people's ears up. Mm. And that led you to mm. that place. Do you know mm. what I mean? And I that, do. And, and, that, and, and, it was, and it's like, a, everything's a learning curve for me. I listen to that record and I'm like, I would never do that now. Mm. I would never, never do that now. Mm. I would never say human 40 times in a record. <laughs> 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 but it was probably just because I couldn't think of anything else to say or I wasn't that goes. experienced as a songwriter. Yeah. But actually, it, it, the dots connected. Self-fulfilling as well, in a way. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I mean, I mentioned Ala Black earlier, because when, when you think about the climate in which you, you entered on, yeah, yeah. there was Ala Black. It was just off the back of Plan B as well. Yeah, yeah. So there's yeah. all these... Mu- people wanted more of the same, almost. Yeah. Right? It, was, it, was st- it was still that era of, like, this, there's an influence of soul music. Yeah. Male I mean? soul music. Male yeah. soul music, yeah. yeah. There's not a huge amount of that at the moment. But at the time, it was coming off the back of that. So yeah. I kind of, yeah, like right place at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. Allo needed a dollar and he got a load of money. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, it, and all of a sudden... Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, this, this thing that you'd just been incubating at, in your studio and, you know, caught him in different, you know, worlds of music. Mm-hmm. You're in front of Jules Holland now and, and you're... you're uh, your performance levels going up, the momentum's building, um, your, your 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 armory that you're gathering with every single scenario, good or bad, right or wrong, it's happening and it's not going to stop. And the album drops and everything changes for you. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Well, I I don't think I, I was really prepared for it to be honest. And uh, I don't. I still. I'm still not really. Like all. All that comes with this. I've tell you the biggest thing for me. What changed? Go on. 
was because when the first song came out, people knew the song, mm. but they weren't s- familiar with me as a person, which I liked at the time. I was like, oh, that's great. Mm. So I can still walk about. Cult classic. People ain't really like yeah. bothering me or whatever. Yeah. That's cool. And then, then you get asked to do different things like, oh, can you want to do the Graham Norton show? And I was like, yeah, I want to do the Graham Norton show. They're like, by the way, Denzel Washington, I definitely want to do the Graham Norton show. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So you go and do these things, but you don't realise what effect that has. Uh, okay. Because like putting music out or being on Radio 1 or Radio 2 or whatever, that's great because that means people come to your shows. Uh. But then when you're on those... The big boy shows. Those like chat shows and that, you know, you do, we did like Ellen and... Uh, Jimmy Fallon, all yeah. those kind of stuff. That means that people know your face, mm. and now you can't walk around Tesco. <laughs> so that's the biggest yeah, thing that I reality. wasn't prepared for, and I mm. still weirds me out now. Does it? Yeah. Well, you could be minding your own business, and then everyone's just staring at you. Well, I'm, I'm I'm six foot five and a <laughs> half, about twenty three stone, and I've got tattoos everywhere. I can't hide behind a lamppost. Yeah. No. <laughs> and um, everyone knows who I am and, and they was like oh sorry I've fucked it now because yeah, yeah, really I'm never going to have any anonymity at all self prophecies coming alive right <laughs> yeah 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 so yeah that's that's the biggest thing that I had to get used to which, which I didn't feel very comfortable with at all you know the other thing though is like you know you take everything every with commercial or you know here you know I don't doubt for a second with the Killer Killer podcast you're going to get recognised god knows how many times in Tesco's now because that's just how we roll uh, but you take everything in your stride yeah. you're extremely yeah. like versatile and um, I think that's what makes people think man I can buy my super approachable. And before uh, you know it, yeah. you, you're double guessing on whether you've met someone before because they're talking to you so candidly and chilled. Yeah. That 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 in itself is it must be testament to your uh, Well, no, I, I, I had a couple of experiences um with artists that I really loved love when I've I tried to approach them to say hello or whatever. <laughs> Talk to me were, about that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I I'm, I'm one of them is not here anymore, so I don't, I don't want to speak ill of the dead. Okay, all right. All right rest <laughs> in peace, whoever you might be. Yeah. yeah. Famous or unfamous, respect. Um, but, like, yeah, a couple of artists that I were approached to say hello to when, when, I was, when I was sort of coming up and doing shows, supporting people, mm. and they were dicks to us. Yeah. I would, you know what I mean? And I always thought, watching that, mm. I was like, I'm never going to be a dick if I have fans like that. Mm. So... I, 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 get, I pray, try to give everybody the time, unless I'm with my kids... Like yeah. it's different. Yeah. If I'm with my kids, leave me alone. <laughs> but yeah. but like I try not to be a dick to anybody. And 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 as you know, people are a fan of your music. I feel like it's my duty to give them the time of day mm. because they might have gone out and bought my music or come to a show or whatever. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So, but they yeah, like you say, approachability. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Like it's one of them things. Like you, you take like if I'm out and I take a picture with one person, it's like like everyone else looks over and go, ah, it's all right for me today yeah, now. And su- suddenly I've taken like 425 <laughs> selfies yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah. when I'm just trying to walk around chest. Food around your mouth, whatever <laughs> yeah, it is, whatever yeah, it might be, exactly. food, toilet, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, a high, that's a high class problem, but one that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I feel like still it's weird, but I shouldn't really complain about it because... Because it can go really, yeah, really quickly. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. Well. I'll, I'll be sitting there complaining to you yeah. in 10 years' time that people weren't doing it no more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. For, yeah, for 10 years on, what happened yeah. to them now? Yeah, um, yeah. Tell me about the craziest, because, you know, you've got enough fans now. We can talk about this. Mm. Tell me the craziest fan experience that you've had. Uh, someone made a voodoo doll of me and threw on stage. What? And I don't know if I've still got it. I'll sh- I, if I've still got it, I'll show you afterwards. I think it was in the garage because one of the kids found it recently and they were like, what is this? <laughs> Put that thing away. <laughs> I was like, it was in Berlin, I think. Because my... my my song got massive in Germany, like, t- t- ridiculous. It was like, I think it was like number one for like three and a half months or something ridiculous. Whoa. And so the fans were a bit mental. Mm. And um, I would wake up on the tour bus and there'd be lots of people waiting outside and so quite interesting looking characters. Mm. Mm. But one night like, someone just threw this doll up on stage and I was like, what is that? 
someone got it off the stage or whatever, mm-hmm. and then afterwards he looked and it was like, oh, it's made of r- like real hair, and it had it looked like someone had taken the time to made it and make like a perfect doll of me <sighs> with real hair for the beard and the. It's very strange. Whoa. With like with like with like proper like my clothes on it as well, like made. Oh, I definitely feel a way about that. Yeah, it's a bit strange. Yeah. Did you ever have a sit? Start getting burning palms and shit. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. No, with a cross on it. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Whoa, yeah, that's a bit deep, isn't it? Yeah. The time that that would have taken some. I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Can't write this stuff. What does you know, listen, I'm gonna ask you a question and it's 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 a good and bad. Uh Good and bad. What what has what has fame given you? Good first. Uh, Apart from the obvious, you know what things that you can you you could certainly say. Well, that's that's a, a blessing. Well, I, I say fame. I mean, uh, success and fame. two different things. Two different. Very things. much so. Yeah, that's why I, I don't say fame. know. I don't know about fame. Mm. I don't know if I could. If I could eliminate that side of it, I mm. think I might. Really? I really think I that's might. Just too, it's too much for you. It's not that it's too much for me. It's just that it's the uncomfortable side of it. Gotcha. Yeah. Like, the the worst thing, the feeling I've ever felt is walking down a red carpet. Mm. The most uncomfortable. It's horrible. And And, like... I don't want anyone out there that's listening to this podcast to feel sorry for me because... And he does take bookings on red carpets, don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) Because, you know, know, it's it's really not that bad, but it it feels horrible is what I'm trying to say. Because they're all looking, everyone's looking. Yeah, and there's like 100 photographers going, look this way, look this way, do this, do that. And you're like, oh, I did, this this is not music anymore. This is something else entirely. Yeah. Yeah, Um, But like... You get invited to play on the Brit Awards. Those are the things you have to do yeah. to do it. Do you know what I mean? What do your friends say? Your friends must because this is a this is an ecosystem we have here, brother. Listen, I've got mates. It's beautiful. Uh, I really my only mates that I see and in contact with are mostly ones from school. Yeah. People I grew up with. You know, a few other good mates from Brighton and that, and yeah. uh, most of them take the piss. <laughs> <laughs> it's the it. British way, isn't it, really? Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's what you need. Mm. That's what you need. You need people to take the piss out of you. Yeah. You really do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. It they drives take, take Americans a, send, send a picture of myself in like a salmon pink fur coat <laughs> and sunglasses on the Brit Awards. And they're like, what the fuck were you thinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Holding what? this picture of a ransom. Yeah, yeah. Kids are old enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but those are the people you need around you. 100%. Yeah. Without that, then the grounding may feel a bit soft, mightn't it? Yeah. And and then, be, I mean, this is my presumption. And your self-importance might creep yes, in a little yes, bit. Yes, 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You get affected really yeah. quickly, and stuff like that. And I don't see that in Rag and Bone, man. I don't see that. No. I've, it's not, it's, a, it's a, a, a guaranteed sign of assurance, isn't it? You know what I mean? The real shit. It's real. Yeah, for real. Comes from a real place. And uh, I had the privy of, uh, you know, just minding my own business, setting up podcasts as one does, and then the tunes come on. New tunes. <laughs> new tunes, New yeah. album. Yeah, man. Let's get into it. We'll talk to me about it. Wow, it's new, rec- new record's done, man. I'm, I, I literally just recorded the last song about a week ago. Uh, most of the tunes are mixed and everything. I'm f- I, feel, I feel like it's a, it's a perfect representation of where I am in my life the record, wow. the way it sounds, the lyrics of it. Like, it's the first record I made in a long time that feels really, I don't want to say happy, but it isn't, it's definitely not sad. And it, and it, and it, and it feels like, I tell you what, it feels quite joyous and it feels uh, hopeful. Mm. And it, it feels hopeful in its, in its sound and in the lyrics and everything. Like, you know, I've written a lot of depressing music. But this is not it. Like this, this, this record. I, I, I basically thought about in the production style. Like, what do I? How do I want to see? How do I see my live shows in the future? Mm. Do you know what I mean? I was going to say that because there must be some songs where you earmark certain moments of yeah respite, yeah. upbeat. Well, like, now and again, I, I'll write a song, and this is not the way you're meant to do it. And my la- my record label don't like it very much, mm-hmm. but. Uh, fuck it. <laughs> and I write songs. Sometimes I go, should we just play a new song 
mm. like in our set that doesn't exist yeah. anywhere. Um, just put it in to see how it goes. And, um, you know, I've done that a few times and it's been like, well, this just feels good. And it this works. This vibe feels good. Wow. And, um, yeah, and I, I kind of... The way this record sounds is because of that. Yeah, spot on as well. Producers. Yeah, I'm, I'm not allowed to tell you okay. <laughs> a couple. <laughs> but we know, I know. But he knows. <laughs> um, yeah, like, I've worked with some really, really cool people on this. Yeah. We talked about Jamie Liddell earlier. I've worked, worked on him, uh, with him on uh, one of the records. And he's a bad boy big um, box as well, you know. Yeah, man, Crazy. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, a guy called Rob Milton, who's incredible, credible producer. Um, we we we've um, we worked together on this record too. Uh, yeah, I just I just I just I worked with this guy called Oak mm. Oak Felder, who's who um, did some like Miguel uh, Alicia Keys and nice. stuff like that. Very very like he's an Atlanta kind of soul uh, boy producer. Like just just ridiculous. So yes, it's it's this this is like the most R and B you'll ever hear, Ragamuffin. Yeah, it yeah. in yeah, yeah. The progression, yeah, growth. Yeah, very different from the last record. Last record was like guitar based, very very depressing. So it's it's a completely different. But you know, nobody wants to hear the same record twice. No, no, the the the. Uh, elasticity, should we say, of your vocal holds mm. true on no matter what you. Put. And that's the that's the quality that you have to look for in a vocalist when you're listening to them as yeah. well, right? I mean, well, there's this, um, the reason I signed to Columbia Records is this, this, this woman, Alison Donald, and this guy, Julian Palmer, who, um, who worked for Columbia at the time, and she said something really important to me that stuck with me from the very start, and she was like, it doesn't matter, like, genre, don't worry about genre, don't worry about what you think you're meant to do. He's like, she was like, your voice is distinctive enough and people will remember it regardless of what genre you, mm-hmm. you do. So don't feel like you're trapped by anything. Exactly. It's just like, just do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's, it's great advice, yeah. you know, early on. Certainly something you can take away. For real. On, on every juncture of what you do. Yeah, Be absolutely. Yourself, you know? Yeah. Keep it, keep it real. Things like that. <laughs> we look forward to, look forward to the album, my brother. And, uh, if they want more, where do they have to go? I mean, when does the re- when's the release out? Uh, well, we've got a song coming out really soon in the, in the next few weeks, um, and then I don't know, man. I mean, we'll just release, we'll just keep releasing tunes, and until people really want the album, mm. and then and then the album's there, ready to go. God, that's in that that is a blessing to have that level of control. <laughs> just do it because you can. Yeah, Love I think that. that's like. There's there's a um, temptation to do music like a certain way. It's like, okay, I'll release a single, then I'll release the album. It's like, well, mm. let's just keep releasing songs until yeah. it feels like people are ready for that one, then we'll give it to them. No rules? No. Music industry's different now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Changed a lot. Yeah. I had no other choice. Just a bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> had no other choice. Um, but you came up through the ranks. You built your house, and now... You're thriving. And uh, Rag and Bone Man, it's been a fucking pleasure having you. Oh, bless you, bruv. It's been a pleasure to do it, man. Yeah. Proper vibes. And uh, if the music I've heard anything to go by, the album's going to be killer, my brother. Bless you. My guy. Rag and Bone Man in the building. Killer Keller podcast. Our lighting was out of fashion. Come on. Sharing is caring. Tell a friend to tell a friend, all right? Crime don't pay, but neither do they. You know what it is. Our lighting was out of fashion. Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't, people. You stay lucky. Easy. That was vibes. Very cool.